This is Michael J. Fox. With your support, we can end Parkinson's once and for all. Get involved at michaeljfox.org. The Michael J. Fox Foundation. Here until Parkinson's isn't. I don't know what most white people in this country feel. But I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome back to Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts, Katina and Garen. Today's topic is gentrification. We first define gentrification, compare it with revitalization, cover a little bit of urban renewal. We give some examples, discuss the economics of gentrification, and then we end it with some thoughts and ideas on how to fix it. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Before we dive into the episode, I wanted to catch some people up. I know we have a lot of new listeners on some some talking points that we have for the show and our voice within this space of black history and justice and learning. Wanted to remind people that Garen and I are white. We don't speak for every white person. Katina's black. She doesn't speak for every black person. We, we definitely don't want this to be the only space that you are getting information and ideas and opinions from. But we really want to invite you to go to other spaces, other podcasts, other authors, other musicians, other books, other media outlets to gather that. And as a reminder, all the people that we follow on social media, that's Instagram and Twitter, everyone we follow is a black and brown person or a black and brown led organization. And those people, people that we trust and we appreciate their opinions and their views and their perspectives on everything that we talk about in the show. And so we invite you to go check all those out. And also, Garen, can you talk a little bit about kind of like just our worldview, what we're talking from so that people kind of understand things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're having a particular conversation here and want to invite everyone into that to hear it as a resource. And we also just want to be authentically who we are. And who we are, we've talked about before. We're Christians, we're interested in justice, and we're not just impartially presenting historical facts, but we have a worldview. And we want to be open with that so you can kind of weigh that in and know who you're listening to. But then we also aren't trying to, you know, convince everyone to just have our worldview. We want to invite you to consider it and want you to also consider other resources and have, I think you're best served by having a lot of different perspectives. So in that, we do want to authentically present who we are. We are Christians, so we're bringing that in kind of fluidly into some of these episodes, some of the the concepts. And we want to just disclaim or explain that as we're doing that, our purpose is not to try to convince everyone who's listening to become Christians or have a Christian worldview. Really, a lot of what we're doing is actually trying to challenge Christianity in America, the evangelical, white evangelical Christianity in America. We're trying to challenge to be a more truly authentic expression of Christianity. I think there's a lot of ways in which white evangelical Christianity has become syncretistic, which is a fancy word for it. They've basically borrowed elements from the cultural worldview of whiteness and kind of combine that with the biblical Christian faith in a way that is toxic or harmful. And people do this all the time. Like when you're growing up as a white evangelical Christian in America, you are receiving all these different sources of information. And you don't actually, as a human being, have the ability to really look into and check the facts and sourcing of all the information you hear. We're all constantly hearing information and most of it you just have to accept as true if it's coming from an authority source you trust. So if you're growing up in church in America, you're hearing all these facts and some of those are coming from the Bible, but some of them are just coming from culture. And if you're growing up in a white culture, a lot of it's coming from just white culture. And so you have, you end up with this white Christianity that is both a mix from our perspective of 
true biblical wisdom, but then also all this other stuff that's mixed in. And so you'll hear us talk about like a colonized Christianity. And and really the concept we're getting at is when we say colonized Christianity, we're talking about this syncretistic mix of truth and just cultural, a lot of times racist distortions. And so as we're kind of having this conversation, we see ourselves largely as challenging Christianity to to go back to being its true self. Well, and we know that many people have a distaste for Christianity from the experiences that they've had from childhood growing up in Christian homes where they saw a hypocrisy and racism. And so there's a lot of pain and trauma associated with probably many of our listeners when it comes to Christianity. It can be triggering. And we're sorry for that. I also have some experiences being a black woman and seeing the hypocrisy of the the American church played out. And you cannot separate discussions about black people in America from the church and from Christianity because many black people who came over to America on ships They were Christians. They brought their Christian faith. Africa was already evangelized. America, uh, maybe not so much, especially in light of what the things that were being done when America was formed. But you cannot separate civil rights from the church because there's history that connects the church. The church was a place of refuge, the black church experience. It was a place of refuge. It was a place of mobilization for civil rights. It was a place where we were taught scriptures in light of, with justice in mind, because we identified so much with people who were being oppressed in the Bible. So that's why you will hear a lot about Christianity as well, because on one side, with white America, they were weaponizing scriptures against black people. And on the other side, black people were clinging to their Christian faith to persevere and continue in hope and to try to compel the country to righteousness and just expression of the Christian faith. But also I wanted to just kind of point out that Brad was talking about how we follow Black influencers, podcasters, voices, writers, organizations. We are not the final authority. We are just three people who are sharing history, but also personal. You'll hear a lot of personal experiences from me to try to bridge the gap so that people can make those connections and humanize some of the things that are read off the page. It's important to us that we support Black voices And so that's why our money goes to the people that we interview, the organizations that we bring on, shining a light on the work that different organizations like The Witness and the Denton African American Scholarship Foundation and some of the others that we've supported, uh, Cecily and Abide, the women's organization in Dallas. It's important that we put our money where our mouth is. And so you're not going to get two white dudes and a black chick that we're just storing up coins, stashing. No, we are taking the money that you give us and we're putting it back into the black community. And that's important, but we're also amplifying black voices so that you can follow them as well, because you're going to need a a well-rounded perspective. And my perspective as a black person is not the only one. There are many black voices in justice before and after me and alongside me. And we need, we, we put show notes, we give you a lot of reference, like books. We refer books, podcasts, articles, television shows, movies, writer, just everything that we can point you to so that you can grow in your understanding of Black history and have the perspective of many Black influencers and voices. Okay, so let's dive into today's topic. We're going to be talking about gentrification, which I'm sure by now most of our listeners have heard that word. Maybe they have some idea of it, but hoping to get a better grasp of it today. So, Garen, let's let's dive in. What do we need to know? So, to begin, the definition of gentrification is the process whereby the character of a poor urban area is changed by wealthier people moving in, improving housing, and attracting new businesses, typically displacing current inhabitants in the process. That's like the Webster 
definition. Okay. My definition or my rewording of this, just to give listeners a good mental picture of what it is we're talking about here, is that racialized or racially harmful gentrification is the common practice of mostly white developers buying up properties in black urban areas that were formerly victims of redlining and then redeveloping those areas into thriving upper-class white condos with Starbucks, Whole Foods, and Trader Joe's on all the corners. And the whole thing is done in such a way that the black former residents don't benefit from the revitalization process, and they're just displaced. Yeah, so it sounds like the Webster's Dictionary, that's not, there's nothing racial about that. Yeah, so gentrification is not exclusively racial, it generally is a process that hurts impoverished communities. For reasons that we'll talk about later, it specifically targets impoverished communities. Basically, the poorer the neighborhood, the more money that could be made in flipping it. And so it targets poor communities, and in those poor communities, most of the people, by definition, are less likely to own homes. More often, they're renters. And so as a neighborhood gentrifies, the renters have their rents just go up and up and up and up, and they're gaining no equity in the increasing land values. Instead, they are working at a job where they are making probably a fixed wage, and they are seeing their rent go up continually. And so they're just hanging on as long as they can until they run out of money, and then they leave with nothing. So that's the typical process that'll happen, and it it harms poor people particularly because those who actually own homes in gentrifying areas have a fixed mortgage. I'm a homeowner. We pay the same amount no matter what the value of our home goes to. So for me, for our family, if the values go up, that's actually a good thing because it means I can remortgage my house and pull cash out to invest in starting a business. It means I could sell and move somewhere else and have money that I've made on my home that's not even taxable. The home profit is not taxable for unless you're like super rich. So for those who own homes, it's actually a good thing when an area gentrifies. But for renters, which are disproportionately poor, it can be super harmful. And in most areas that in the reality in America, in our urban spaces, is that the poorest areas, which are then the ones most likely to be targeted for gentrification, generally are those neighborhoods that were formerly redlined and formerly were entirely black and now are still mostly black. In many cases, they are almost entirely black. And those are the areas where the land values are the lowest. And so the developers, the urban developers, can make the largest amount of profit on flipping those areas, removing the current residents, building high-rise condos that are have good access to downtown, and bringing in upper middle class whites to live in those spaces. Okay, and when you said there would be a bunch of like Trader Joe's and Starbucks, I could just feel all my white friends getting all excited, especially for like the Trader Joe's. But I'm assuming we'll get there, but how? why is that a bad thing for even white people? Because it sounds like it's only beneficial, but what's the, is there something that's not great in that situation for? Yeah, you're a little bit dipping into, there is a tension to the conversation about gentrification. And the tension is that we are talking about neighborhoods that are under-resourced and under-invested in and a aging infrastructure. And a lot of these neighborhoods that are majority black, formerly redlined inner city districts, there has been an exodus of businesses. Whenever white people all fled the inner cities and moved to the suburbs, they brought a lot of their capital with them. And there was a lot of just vacant spaces, vacant businesses that are just shut down. And so then they get graffiti on them and there's no investment in them. And even as a side note, for anyone who's watched those house flipping shows knows the whole concept of the house flipping show is you want to buy the worst house in the best neighborhood because that's where you can make the best return on your investment. And the better the neighborhood is, the higher the return on investment you will make for improvements. So if you are in a nice neighborhood and your house doesn't have a pool, then you're going to add a lot of value to your house by adding a pool. But if you're in a neighborhood that's under-resourced and underprivileged, you actually have a smaller financial incentive to improve anything. Because when you try to sell the house, it's actually not going to add much value to it. So 
in a lot of these under resourced communities, there's actually not much incentive for homeowners or for anyone to make improvements. And so you end up with these these neighborhoods that just become economically depressed. The money has fled, the investment has fled. And so there is a good side to money going into those places. Investment, capital, businesses, Trader Joe's actually has some benefit. A lot of black communities would benefit from Trader Joe's going in because there's in a lot of these communities, there's not good access to, to food, to fresh food. So there's a benefit to that. And that's where we go back to the reality that gentrification is good for homeowners. If black people actually owned their homes in these communities, then they would actually gain benefit from the gentrification process. The problem is in America, a lot of black people don't own their homes. And so they end up just becoming victims and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And in America, because of past racism, Black people on average have a tenth of the wealth of white people. And so when you talk about things that are making the rich richer and the poor poorer, and you're talking about gentrification specifically targeting majority black communities, you end up with a situation where a lot of black people are being displaced, losing their job, because in a lot of these communities, poorer black people might not have their own car. And if you're in an urban area, you might not need your own car. But then if you're displaced because property values all around you are going up and you can't afford to live there anymore, you can't just move out to a suburb and commute in if you don't own your own vehicle. And so you end up having to move either into smaller and smaller accommodations in order to be able to afford rent or you have to move away and probably lose your job in the process. And so gentrification also can increase homelessness and increase all kinds of the problems that come from people losing their homes and, and their jobs at the same time. And so there's there's a big justice component, but there's also, there is some benefit to gentrification. And at the end of the episode, we'll talk a little bit about how could we change, like some possible policy changes that could actually make gentrification a little bit more beneficial across the board. But there is a tension. And, and then a second key problem with gentrification, as it often happens, is that it doesn't value truly multicultural development and it doesn't leave room for black businesses that are existing to grow and thrive and benefit from the process of gentrification. But instead it displaces them and it essentially it replaces one culture with the developments of another. Namely, it replaces the existing black culture with you know Starbucks and Trader Joe's as beneficial as they could be if they were part of a bigger multicultural whole if they're replacing all the existing multicultural businesses that exist in a space, it can oftentimes just become a space that's essentially completely catering to white people. White people in these areas that we're talking about are oftentimes higher income than the existing residents who are there. And so they can be just de facto the people who all the businesses are catering to. And so then if there's not a deliberate effort to bring black and brown businesses in on the gains of gentrification and not a deliberate effort to celebrate multiculturalism, you can oftentimes end up with just black culture just being lost. One other thing just before we dive in fully, just to mention how impactful gentrification is. For a lot of people, a lot of our listeners probably live in suburbs or maybe even rural areas. So this maybe feels a little bit further from home. But just to recognize that in America, most people live in cities. And just taking two particular metro areas, Los Angeles County, it's one county, has more people in it than 10 states. The county of Los Angeles has more people than Wyoming, Vermont, Alaska, North and South Dakota, Delaware, Montana, Rhode Island, Maine, and New Hampshire. But New York City, yeah, all combined. Dang. New York City has more people than the mayor of New York represents more voters than 18 U.S. senators. Just just the, the one city. So the things that happen in urban areas by definition, affect a lot of people. Like millions of people are have been displaced through gentrification. So just to paint the picture of the scale of this problem, it's not some obscure thing. You might not hear a lot about it because the news media that's catering to suburbs is not going to talk a lot about 
these problems that don't affect people in the suburbs. But this is actually a huge reality that is detrimental to the lives of millions of people. And so it's important to understand what's going on and to have some ideas of what we can do to improve it or fix it. And you kind of spoke to it a little bit earlier about this wasn't just like an accident. It's not like cities are giving the okay to businesses to go into these random areas of town where these random people groups are and randomly improving it. A lot of this is all, every kind of topic that we touch on on the podcast is kind of all intertwined. There's like a through line and it's, and maybe you can talk a little bit on that of how you said a lot of the owners in these urban areas, or they don't own homes. Like Mm -hmm. it's not because they don't want to own a home, I would assume. Mm -hmm. It's because they were like structurally forced not to almost. Maybe you can speak to that idea of this wasn't by accident. Gentrification is not a... It's very strategic and intentional. Mm -hmm. It targets people groups. It targets low income. It targets the the disparage, basically. Yep. And a lot of times by actual structures in our government. So it's not like just random people making random decisions. It It was policies in play that forced people... Yeah, that forced that hands. Here. Yep. So let's let's dive into that. We're gonna t- need to talk about to really understand gentrification. We're gonna need to talk about both the history of how we got here, which is kind of what you're driving for, and then after that, we'll talk about some of the economics of of what's happening. So on that that history front, let's go all the way back to just the creation of housing in America. In very early America, there was shortages of housing and people just kind of built their own housing. It's kind of every man for himself. And people would just, you know, make it work, find places to live. But then there was huge shortages of housing at the early part of the 20th century. And so Mm -hmm. the federal government, through the New Deal, Roosevelt decided we need to do something to help with these housing shortages. And so the, the federal government subsidized and created an engine to create a whole bunch of housing for Mm -hmm. people in America. And that New Deal solution was explicitly discriminatory. It did not create housing for everyone equally. So from the very beginning, the the New Deal advertised the benefits of home ownership in explicitly white spaces and communities. So they advertised directly to white people that you guys should try to own your own home. And simultaneously, The FHA, the VA, and the HOLC, Home Loan Corporation, they created loans that were available only to white people. They loaned to developers to build explicitly white communities. This Uh, this is in the early 1900s? Is that what you said? Yeah, so the New Deal was like in the 30s, and this unfolded, I mean, throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So the whole redlining area, and and actually we talk a lot about this in our redlining episode, which if you haven't listened to, you should go back and listen to. It'd be even a good foundation for this whole conversation. But we had explicitly racist policies. Just reading from the FHA manual from that time, and said, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that properties shall continue to be occupied by the same social or racial classes. So they're explicitly the FHA manual taught its lenders not to lend to people who were going to be integrating neighborhoods. The FHA promoted racial covenants, which were a form of neighborhoods preventing any black people from moving in, and other instruments of segregation through underwriting standards that discouraged loans in areas that were, quote, infiltrated by inharmonious racial or nationality groups. So these government branches explicitly lent to people and projects that would be segregated and that would keep black people contained in these inner city urban areas. And then in these same urban areas where black people were forced to live, there was a multi-pronged approach to devalue and in some cases destroy those homes. And so first of all, there was racial terror. There were entire communities like Greenwood and Tulsa that were just destroyed. There were cases of hundreds or more homes being destroyed in black communities in dozens of locations across America, including Greenwood, including in Atlanta, in East St. Louis, and in other places. There were also, and we've mentioned this before, there were these places called drowned towns, where oftentimes in those days black people were forced to live in 
whatever the undesirable locations were in their context. And oftentimes that meant swampland. So a lot of early black communities had to build on swampland. And then when those black communities made it work and started to thrive, a lot of times those towns then were drowned. They would build dams on the rivers or they would divert rivers and literally flood and destroy black communities. So examples like Oscarville, Georgia, which was flooded following lynchings and racial violence, or Coigula, Alabama, which had the first black-owned railroad until it was flooded. Susanna, Alabama, or Vanport, Oregon, are just examples of towns, but this happened throughout America where towns would be literally submerged. And then you had urban renewal, In 1949 and 1954, there were housing acts that were passed, and urban renewal was this process whereby the federal government gave money to 1,200 projects that different states would implement. And for those projects, a lot of times they would use eminent domain or just in other ways they would take homes, take land from communities to be reworked into these various public projects. And in the vast majority of cases, that land was taken from black people. Actually, black people lost land to eminent domain at a rate that was 10 times that of white people. They were 10 times more likely to lose their homes to eminent domain than white people. Because eminent domain was used as a weapon of racism, of systemic racism. At its peak in the mid-1960s, urban renewal displaced a minimum of 50,000 families annually. And a 1964 House of Representatives report estimated the figure to actually be closer to 66,000. Black families were replaced, like I said, at a rate that is 10 times higher than white families. And federal subsidies went to more than 400 cities, suburbs, and towns that supported 1,200 projects and displaced a minimum of 300,000 families about 1.2 million Americans, mostly black. America was only 11% black at that time, but black people comprised 55% of those who were displaced. Also, there were highways that were specifically targeted, demolished portions of, and subdivided black communities. So highways were actually used, and, and they were explicit even in their language describing this. They described ghetto clearance as the side benefit of placing highways in certain locations. They would steer them towards places that were deemed to be ghettos in order to clear those ghettos. But then the people who were there, who were displaced by the construction of these new highways, they didn't just go away. They were then forced to relocate into other surrounding areas, and, and it caused all kinds of chaos in the surrounding communities. So examples are Treem in New Orleans, the Brooklyn area of Charlotte, the Overtown in Miami, Detroit's Black Bottom and Paradise Valley neighborhoods, Greenwood in Tulsa. Uh, there's, we've talked about Greenwood before, and I think we've mentioned before that there were two different highways that were placed right through Greenwood to subdivide it. And then a portion of Greenwood was also taken by the state for the construction of a university. And this happened all over the country too. Many universities were built on former black neighborhoods. Like in Denton, Texas, where Texas Women's University, right here where we live, they were expanding the university and they pushed the black residents of Quakertown out to what kind of was it? It wasn't swampland, but what was it? It was like a, what was it, Garen? It was the undesirable land that was on the far side of the industrial area. Yeah. Kind of like subject to pollution. And- right. And so even now, Southeast Denton is where the black residents were pushed into. They are behind an industrial plant. There are many, like the jail, the county jail, the police departments. So they would push black people out, but then put all these barriers around the bails bondsmen, predatory lending to exploit people who were impoverished, people who were displaced. And so there's this constant activity of pushing black people out, them adjusting to where they are and doing the best they can, and then pushing them out from there, just constantly, just continuously pushing them out to where they, to the point where they have nowhere to go. In Memphis, I'm from Orange Mound in Memphis, Tennessee. And it's so crazy because a lot of this stuff doesn't age well because a, a lot of towns are called places like White Haven. We have a White Haven in Memphis 
or white settlement or white, you know, white this, white that. You know, just names that and look even, and I would even say look up why they're called that. I exactly. Mean, we, we drive through White Settlement outside of Fort Worth, and it, look up. I would just challenge you if you're like, wait, there's a city called White Settlement, right? Why do you think it's called White Settlement? Well, you should look it up. Right, you should look it up because it's full racism on display. And also, a thing that we don't really talk about with gentrification is how when Black people would form a community and do the best that they could with no resources and no support from their city, with roads or with things like plumbing or even access to grocery stores, highways running through their neighborhoods, that type of thing, public act, like bus buses or public access to things that a lot of other communities or white communities would have. So black communities would be highly under-resourced so roads, raggedy, just when you think about the standard services that a city or a town or a county would provide in a suburban area, none of that is available. They have all these things against them, but then when they make do and then the government, local government, or even developers come back and say, well, we want to buy your property. And if you're poor... And they're offering you, a lot of times they're not getting offered, they're only getting offered a smidget of what they should be getting because the developers are then going to take that land. That happened in my community in Orange Mound. Orange Mound in Memphis is the first neighborhood or community that was actually created for black people. And there was a, a level of affluence there. There were many people in the community, teachers. It was a prosperous community. And now it is not. They wanted to expand the airport because the airport is not too far from the Orange Mound neighborhood. And so they started buying up houses. I remember I might have been in middle school or high school. Houses started being bought up. And of course, if people are poor, what what are they going to do? If they're already struggling to make ends meet and somebody comes in and says, I'm going to give you this lump sum of money, which doesn't really amount to much. But at that moment when you got to decide, am I going to continue struggling or am I going to take this piece of money? So that's how a lot of black people lose their homes is because the, these developers will come in and say, or the city, or like you said, eminent domain, they come in and they buy these homes for a fraction of what they're really going to benefit and profit when they get done developing. But there's, in Orange Mound, where I'm from, there's so many big spaces where houses used to be because then they dropped the, the airport expansion. And so you'll see like five houses in a row and then 10 lots where there used to be houses, where my friends lived. Because we were, that's our community. You'd see, I drive through there when I go home and I'm like, this person used to live here, this person used to live there, this store was here. It's completely annihilated. But now it's being gentrified. So white people have started moving in to my hometown neighborhood and they are renting houses out. And of course, Now that residents are moving into the area, the value is more important. And so I've seen that in a community that I am from and that initially started off as a black town, a black space of refuge that went neglected after people become displaced and racism and all the things. And then I think about people who they've lived in a neighborhood for their whole entire life, right? Right. And they were able to weather the storm of all the things that happened. So think about a 70, 80-year-old person that's lived and grew up in a neighborhood and lived there their whole entire life. And they've seen all the things that have happened. And they get to retirement age. They're 65, for example. They get to retirement age. And they should be able to benefit from having paid for their home in full, having taxes that are reasonable or what they're used to for that area. But then when gentrification happens, those tax rates go way up. And people who are now at retirement age and living on a fixed income, they can't afford to live there just because of the taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, because when when you worked a job for 30 years and you retire, you know you're going to be making even less money than you were making before. And so many people get pushed out just from that. Mm. Yeah, I think another really good example of it, some of this happening was Seneca Village in New York City. 
in the 1840s, it was a thriving black community where half of the African Americans owned their homes, which was a really high rate for that time. It was actually five times higher than the average for the city. But then in 1857, Seneca Village was torn down to build Central Park, and that's where Central Park is now. And this happened all throughout the country. Oftentimes, it was white people who held the levers of power in the context of a society that was explicitly racist, much more so in that day, just openly white supremacist. And so whenever they needed a place to build a highway, a university, a park, anything, those public works projects generally targeted black communities and demolished them. But then even the black communities that weren't destroyed or demolished, they were devalued in a way that still created the context for gentrification to take advantage of. And that was through, again, through redlining. And I'll just really quickly run through some stuff that we spent a whole episode on in that redlining episode. So again, go listen to that for a full explanation of these. But a lot of neighborhoods were rezoned from commercial to industrial. Polluting factories were put in to black communities and black communities are a lot more likely to have, they have higher rates of pollution and lead pipes and all these problems because they were not treated as residential properties. Property taxes were raised disproportionately in black areas so that black communities sometimes paid nine times the property tax rate that next door neighboring white communities paid. In some cities around America, the average was two to three times the rate that black people had to pay for property taxes. There was predatory lending where black people just weren't able to get conventional loans that white people were able to get. And then there was other forms of lending that were predatory and could make black people lose their homes if they missed a single payment. There was frequent house bombings, hundreds of house bombings around America where black people who bought into neighborhoods, if they were the first black person to buy into a white neighborhood, their house would likely be bombed as retaliation for integrating a neighborhood. There was also just discrimination in unions where black people were explicitly denied membership to 30 of America's largest unions in that era. And so black people couldn't get the same jobs that were paying the same wages. And so all of this together had the effect of creating these black urban areas that were economically depressed. One final factor worth mentioning that kind of continues to today with the discriminatory lending Lending has just always been something that has been unfair towards black communities, and that's still true today. In the early days, the FHA and the VA, like I said, were explicitly not lending to black people or black developments. But then even today, like you said, Katina, you'll see payday lenders that oftentimes charge 50% or more interest rates. You'll see them in poorer communities because they're taking advantage of people's poverty. They'll take desperate people who have no money and say, we'll give you a couple weeks advance on your money in exchange for these exorbitant interest rates. And when you're poor, sometimes you have to do that because you have to keep your electricity on or have to make your payments so you don't lose or get evicted from your house. And so then you'll end up in this trap of poverty. There's a high cost to poverty in America where a lot of times poor people have to rent their appliances because they can't afford to replace an appliance that breaks or they'll just be taken advantage of in all these different ways. So you end up with poor places trapped in poverty where the land values are lower, crime rates are going to be higher because you have people who are just desperate to get by or just coping with generational trauma. Right. And then you have these white developers will see the land values and say like, hey, let's all cooperate together and buy up this entire district and let's flip the whole thing. And so what you'll have then is Either you have rent protections or you don't. In some cities, there's rent protections where rents can only go up at a certain rate. Or in other cities, those rent protections don't exist. And so you have rents. If there's no rent protection, they'll just start to skyrocket. Renters will deliberately raise rents either to make more money from renters paying more or to just try to, as a form of eviction, trying to get rid of the people who are tenants so that they can sell the building. In gentrifying districts, oftentimes you can sell a building at a big premium if there's no current renters because the whole point is to destroy the building and build a high-rise there. And so the landlords will cause the rents to skyrocket and kind of just bleed the people who are there, the current tenants, dry of whatever savings they might have as they try to hang on. 
And then in, in some places there actually are rent protections, and so they'll use other methods to get rid of the residents. And some of those common methods are first just that landlords will stop fixing everything. They'll right. allow the building to fall into disrepair. They will allow roaches to just fester, allow places to essentially become uninhabitable until everyone moves out or the city just condemns the space and gives them justification to move people out and demo it. Or landlords will just be belligerent and they'll go into these spaces and just yell, just be v- verbally and psychologically abusive towards their tenants. Slum lords. Yeah, they'll just tell them to leave. In many in investigating this episode, there's all these accounts of people just talking about how their landlord would just come and every day yell at them and tell them it's time for you to go, just leave. Sometimes landlords will also offer buyouts where they'll say like, hey, if you'll stop renting, we'll give you this cash sum up front, which I mean, I guess that's better than the other methods, but it still leaves the people in the situation of taking this short-term benefit to move out and then find that the rents have all skyrocketed everywhere so much that they can't afford to live in the community anymore. So in Orange Mound, where I'm from, now there are efforts towards revitalizing the community. And there have been for the past, I think, couple of decades, which has encouraged black commerce, black businesses, which is so much better than gentrification. And there's a difference when you come in and you sweep and you take over and you push people out versus trying to revitalize the community and pour into the people who have been stuck there, who have stayed there, who have invested their lives in activism there, who have had to do the work when the local government wouldn't, who have had to work together to protect their schools, protect their community. And so I do applaud. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to pass up the opportunity to, to, to say that there are efforts where there's an attempt to revitalize the community versus gentrifying. So it's, it, it, and they've seen some progress there. And then one final thing that landlords will oftentimes do is, In a lot of places, they can't just evict people if they're paying their rents. And so they can get an exception, though, where they're allowed to force people to move out on a temporary basis in order to make necessary repairs. So they'll let the building fall into disrepair, then send everyone out temporarily to make repairs, but they'll just drag those repairs on indefinitely until the tenants just eventually give up and find somewhere else to move. So it's another common shady practice that they'll use. Yeah, maybe we can start to get into, well, gentrification seems bad, so how do we just stop it? How do we not do it anymore? What can our listeners do? It sounds like what Katina was just talking about, revitalization, sounds awesome. How do we get everyone to do that and not gentrification? Yeah. And that's why I think revitalization is key, because it honors the legacy of people who have had to be forced out and displaced over and over again. And it gives them a sense of security and stability and allows them to, because I know that we live, the country now is more transient. People tend not to stay in the communities and the areas that they are from. But for black people who are living in black neighborhoods, that's not the case. A lot of times they're in their communities until they are forced out. And so I think it's an act of, repairations and reparations, because reparations doesn't just come in the form of, of money, even though I'm an advocate of reparations. It also should come in the form of reparative work to restore communities, especially when they made an effort to build something from nothing, and then it was taken from them, and these things are documented. And even just the acknowledgement, we ran a highway through your town, or we flooded the town and it's underwater. Like just acknowledgement and caring for the residents who are there and helping them to build their businesses, restore their schools, support the churches, the faith centers that are there, making sure that there are no food deserts, putting grocery stores there, planting African-American grocery store owners in those communities. Because oftentimes in black communities, there are people who are of other cultures that are in our communities taking our money and we're not benefiting 
And that's nothing against other cultures who come in. But if black people have been living in a space for decades upon decades, then black people should benefit, especially when oftentimes they've been put in those spaces because they've been displaced. I think there should be black grocers because food deserts are a huge thing. That's happening all over the country where black communities are used to having a grocery store. Either the prices are jacked way up or major grocers leave that community and people have to go way, way, way across town. And everybody doesn't have the transportation to do that. Mm -hmm. Things that people take for granted, like being able to jump in your car and drive somewhere, everybody doesn't have the transportation. You, you would think that everyone in America should have a smartphone, a car, and the things that we take for granted, but everybody doesn't, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about our elders who are still living in these communities and suffering on fixed incomes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good point to the people that would say, well, why don't we do that for white communities? Why just do that for black communities? And I think this episode... Because white communities weren't displaced. Yeah, and I think th this episode and the redlining episode, yeah, I think it's abundantly clear the displacement and the disparities that exist between even home ownership and stuff was on purpose from the government, policy-wise. This wasn't an accident. I think something I like to bring up a lot is let's look at the disparities between black homeowners and white homeowners. Okay, you got to ask yourself, there's a reason for those disparities, right? There has to be a reason for that. And I think it's going to come down to two reasons. One is you just think black people are lazy or they don't want homes or they just can't for some reason, like biologically. Or you have to think that there are systems in place that were put in place to make those disparities come to fruition. And so it's like you're either, one is like a racist view that's been disproven. And then the other one is factual statement that's been proven throughout history. And so I think you always have to look at that no matter the disparity, we're looking at kind of gentrification, redlining, home ownership, and that kind of gap. But but you've got to ask yourself, why do these disparities exist? It's always going to be a good question for you. Like, mm -hmm. there's a reason why disparities exist. Well, and yeah. not to mention that drugs were poured into these black communities. So a lot of black communities end up being crime infested, one, because of poverty, but two, also because there was an active, like an effort to flood the communities with, with drugs. In, so, in a lot of black communities, you'll see a liquor store on every corner. Yeah, well, because they were rezoned as industrial districts. If white communities are residential, because white people had the power and controlled the zoning, and so liquor stores can't go into residential areas. But because black districts were rezoned as industrial districts, you could have the pawn shops and the strip clubs and the liquor stores would go into those spaces, the casinos and right. like... They would go into those spaces and continue to depress those areas. Mm -hmm. So something maybe to get into here, like from your point, I don't get us wrong. We would be in support of anything that just reduces poverty in general. So gentrification does hurt white people. Urban renewal did hurt some white people. The problem is disproportionately born by black people. And so there's this inseparable racial element to it and racial justice demands that we do something. But also, I would be in support of anything that helps any poor person. So I think gentrification is a problem across the board. And even though it has a lot of overlap with racism, support anything that is generally helping people own their own homes and have, have helping people have a stake in their community and the ability to continue to live there as the community progresses. Right. All of these things that we're talking about, there's a lot of different policy solutions that could help. I think the government could come up, I mean, I could come up with any number of creative ways to address the problem of gentrification. And so there's not like one specific answer, but all the answers revolve around this concept of somehow sharing the gains of the process of redevelopment with everyone who's there. And not just displacing and taking land from one group in order to create something for another. But how do you, with policy, just give everyone a stake in it? And I think the. An equitable stake. Yeah. I think the easiest way to do that, or one of the, the most kind of pivotal ways that we could address gentrification, it would operate in, to some degree as insurance against gentrification, is just to give everyone 
a way to own their homes. In America, renters are super common. And I'm not saying we do away with all forms of rent because sometimes people choose to rent because they're in an area short term and they don't know, they want the ability to relocate quickly. But in a lot of cases, the American system is built for homeowners in a way that deliberately harms renters. And people get trapped renting and can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. And so just talking about the economics for a second, first of all, America, way back in the 19, I think 1919, we created this tax exception where mortgage interest and property taxes are deductible from your taxes. And that policy is universally, economists know that that's not efficient. So whether it's conservative, Republican economists or liberal Democrat economists, economists will all agree this is not a good policy. But homeowners are a large voting block of Americans and they like being able to deduct their property taxes and interest. And so it has continued to today. But the effect of it is, the effect of this government policy is renters are harmed, homeowners are helped. Because what happens is when you can deduct your taxes and your interest, it makes it cheaper for you to own a home. And when you can own a home for cheaper, it means you can buy a bigger home. Whenever you're looking at your monthly payment to buy a home, you can afford a bigger, more expensive home if your effective payment is going to be less because of these tax deductions. And so over time, it's just put this upward pressure on the price of homes where people can, white people who are majority of the homeowners from these historical realities of discrimination have benefited from these home prices that have just gone up exponentially over the course of time. And what happens then is when homes are more expensive, rents are also more expensive. And so renters who are disproportionately black, but also just skew poor, renters just get trapped in these rents that are getting raised. And then there's just these shortages of housing and there's the prices just trap people in poverty and in a cycle of not owning their own home. And then also one other thing we could say is just that our lending practices in America, which again, the government can change what our practices and policies are. Like we can pass laws anytime we want. We had propaganda on the show and he just pointed out so helpfully, all this stuff is just made up. Politicians just write what the rules of the road are and then those become what's normal. But we could change these things. And right now in America, our lending laws factor in your debt to asset ratio and benefit people who own a lot of assets. So if you have a bunch of assets and not much debt, you can borrow a bunch of money at cheap interest. But if you don't have a bunch of assets, you can't borrow money. And our lending laws also, like the way that credit is scored, it rewards people who already have a lot of credit established. The number of accounts that you already have determines how easily you can get more accounts. And so our lending laws already are written to benefit the people who are in, the people who own their homes, the people who already have lots of credit. Those are the ones who can benefit from these systems that will help them get more. And then the system is built so that people who don't already have a lot of assets are trapped in rent and can't get in. They can't get a slice of the pie. And so I think the solution needs to come from some form or at least one step in the right direction is some form of subsidy or encouragement or reparations in the form of helping people own their own homes. I love your idea of capping or removing the tax burden, the property tax burden on people in retirement. That's again, that's it's these simple. are things we could just we could just do that if we wanted to. If there was a will from America to do that, we already have social security that helps elderly people. Why would we not do that? Why do we not value people and their livelihood and their ability to survive over a few extra tax dollars that are already not needed in gentrifying areas. Gentrifying areas already have a lot of inflow of tax revenue. Well, think about those homes that are made historic landmarks and the benefits that they get. Mm -hmm. That happens all the time. And we should consider our, our black elders who have actually made it to retirement in these communities that have been just pommeled, we should consider them them and their homes historic landmarks. Mm. The fact that they survived. Yeah, and we can do these things if we had the will to do it. 
I, I, another idea would be just what if we created a almost like how a, a workers have a 401k, just mm-hmm. this automatic account that transfers with them between jobs that's a form of savings that's tax privileged. And what if we created for renters, say like a 5% of their rent that landlords have to put into a transferable account that could then eventually be used towards a down payment to help renters be able to buy their own homes. Or the government, as a form of reparations, could just lend money to former victims of redlining. Black people throughout America have almost all universally been victims in one form or another of redlining. The government could lend money at at cost interest rates to black communities. And if the government did that at cost, the government can borrow money for almost nothing right now and could lend money to help black people have to get into the home ownership game that they were denied access to early on. And all of these would insulate or protect black people from gentrification. It wouldn't completely fix the problem because even if you own your own home, your property taxes can still go up. But it would at least give some solid form of protection to if you own your own home and values go up, then even if you have to leave, you can at least sell your home for a profit to get you started where you're going next. And I just think if we did this in specifically disparaged, historically disparaged communities, which most often are black communities, we would give black people the opportunity to invest in their communities in ways that we have not been afforded to. A lot of times we have white flight that creates black communities. So as black people integrate, white people leave. But then because of how horrible the conditions can be in some black communities, black people encourage their children to, yeah, get your education and get out of here. You hear that growing up, you know, leave the hood, get out of the hood. It would give young people and people who go out, get education and have, you know, the privilege of some of these resources to put that back into our communities and not have this mentality of we need to get out of here. Mm -hmm. You know, because it just creates more poverty. It, it just continues the cycle when black people don't want to be in their own communities. And that's the way you see mm-hmm. your community as a place to flee from. Yeah. I want to go real big picture real quick just to challenge. I think we probably have a good number of conservative listeners who have this perspective of just the free market needs to handle everything. And just to challenge that to some degree, and just to help broaden people's worldview, I think it's worth inserting here a concept called diminishing returns or diminishing marginal returns. It's an economics concept. And it's this idea that the more you you have of anything, the less each extra unit is worth. So a, a good example is French fries. If you're hungry and you eat a French fry, the first French fry is going to be so satisfying and delicious. But as you keep eating French fries you get more and more full and each extra french fry is worth less and less to you until by the time you have had most of your french fries, the extra one, you can take it or leave it. You don't, it doesn't even really benefit you. And if you keep eating french fries too long, eventually they're just harming you. You actually are full and it's undesirable. And that's the way in, in economics that there's this concept that is almost universally applicable in the world. Like almost anything, you get a TV, your first TV is really valuable to you, but a second TV doesn't actually add much benefit to you. A little bit, you can now avoid walking into your living room, but it doesn't really bring much benefit. And this is true also of money, that if you go and give $1,000 to a renter who's struggling to make it by or is trapped in a cycle of payday loans, the value of that money, it could be life-changing. But if you go and give a $1,000 check to Jeff Bezos, it is not going to be worth his time to cash it. He will not care. And it doesn't have to be Jeff Bezos for that to be true. You give $1,000 to just you know an ordinary millionaire who doesn't have a spaceship, they're not even going to care. Because money itself has diminishing marginal returns, diminishing marginal worth. And so as we in America envision what we want our world and our society to be. If we build a society that's very unequal, and this isn't even doesn't have to be a racial conversation, just in general, if we have a society that's very unequal, then you end up with poor people who are trapped in poverty and rich people who don't even gain much benefit from that money versus if you 
do some form of create some kind of system where money and resources can be accessible to the poor people for whom it actually has greater worth and value, then you can get people out of their trap and cycles of poverty that are oppressive, traumatizing, cause people like people who are don't know where their next meal is going to come from don't have the ability to care about what grades they're getting on their exams or invest in their future or their education. They don't have the time horizon mentally to think about starting a business and what they want the world to be like in, you know, want their future to be like in 10 years if right now they can't eat. And so giving people some kind of stability actually creates a world in which we can develop more and economically could be beneficial to everyone. And I'm not talking full communism where you take away incentives. I think people need incentives and rich people need the ability to have an incentive to start businesses that actually are doing good for the world. But to to move away from this concept where where we think that the free market is just going to solve everything. Because right now what we have in America, the reality is that inequality in America, so the portion of money that's held by the richest 1%, has doubled every decade or two for like the last 40 years. Like we are sliding towards greater and greater inequality and sliding in the direction of what would eventually become feudalism, where it's just rich people controlling everything. And it's actually economically not efficient. So you have seen America's growth rate, our GDP growth rate, has stagnated for the last 40 years because it's actually not beneficial. It actually doesn't lead to more innovation when you don't have a middle class. The middle class are the people in any society who have enough cushion that they can actually think about the future and innovate and think about what they want to do for their future and get an education, build up their lives. And the middle class are the people who also at the same time have the incentive because they they don't have wealth yet, they have the incentive to try hard to get it. So the middle class in any society is going to be the group of people that do most of the innovating, most of the patents, most of the expansion of the economy is going to come from a middle class. And America is the greatest economy in the world currently because historically we had a really strong middle class. But that middle class is fading And it's actually, for the first time a couple of years ago, a majority of Americans are no longer middle class because we currently, we don't have policies that support a middle class. People slide into poverty or slide into wealth. And poor people don't have the, they have a lot of incentive, but they don't have a lot of ability to get out of the trap of poverty. And rich people don't have a lot of incentive because they're already rich. And so oftentimes what they end up doing is just enjoying their wealth and letting they invest it in something and then they just kind of in, enjoy their wealth or they make more money by doing things that actually are harmful for society. If the government doesn't prevent it, rich people have a lot of ways that they can gain money actually to the to the detriment of society as a whole. So we need to just kind of rethink what kind of world we want to live in and create policies that are going to actually support the middle class if we want to actually thrive as a country and as an economy. And specifically, I just have to keep reiterating because I know a lot of white listeners or white people would will tend to say that, well, why should we have to do that? You know, it's every man for himself. People need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. But from my perspective, again, it's more about when the government, and there's a history where communities have been disparaged on purpose, when communities have been drowned out, snuffed out, lynched out, redlined, then I think it is imperative that there is an effort to repair the damage that is done to those communities because you've impacted the potential for generational wealth and just for these generations to do well because they could have been business owners or maybe they were business owners and they were snuffed out. They could have lived in, in better conditions and done better for themselves had the government or the white racist community, had they left them alone in the first place. So this is something that, especially in America, this is something that we should do because it's the right thing to do to repair. You don't, people want to name streets after Martin Luther King and name schools after Malcolm X and have these events 
these city paid Juneteenth events and and things like that or naming a school after somebody, that's all well and good. So you're acknowledging that the wrong was done. Take it a step further by fixing or helping to repair or giving the resources so that we can repair our own communities in the way that we deem fit, in the way that we envision before y'all came and ripped it to shreds, not one time, but several times, and continued to displace us and put us out of our own communities where we were doing the work or where you infiltrated it with drugs. You infiltrated it in an attempt to destroy and to bring down so that you can then go back and displace everyone by buying them out with just a little piece of money or push them out because they're impoverished so you can make it like it was supposed to have been when we actually owned it, but now you benefit from it. My thing is, if you're acknowledging that there was a problem, do the work. History says that there was a problem. We have all these towns named after white, like racism (laughs) or white accommodation or white upliftment. We have all this white flight. We have the documents, the history shows that this stuff happened, that we didn't make it up. Fix it because there are still people, there are still descendants from, there are still people who were a part of the Tulsa race massacre who are living right now And they're over 100 years old, but they're alive right now. And they still have not seen an effort to repair the damage other than saying, yeah, that happened. It was so sad. Mm -hmm. Fix it. This is how you fix it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you are looking for more information on what we discussed, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. If you'd like to play a supportive role in the podcast and be able to vote for future topics, you can support us on Patreon for $5 a month at patreon.com backslash black history for white people. We are just 25 patrons away from reaching 100, which is when we're going to release a t-shirt that we will make available to some of our patrons and also for sale to the general public. On our next episode, we will be discussing the Biloxi Wade-In. We'll leave you with this quote from Alyssa Cole. People bury the parts of history they don't like. Pave it over like African cemeteries beneath Manhattan skyscrapers. (laughs) 